Okay, this is Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly tech show. Uh, you get to ask us some questions about bikes, tech problems you've had, maybe things you just want to know about. Um, you get your questions into us and we'll answer them. Uh, there's an email address right there on the screen or you can add them in the comments below. Hi Dolly, I've got a Trek Roscoe 8, which I love to maintain myself, thanks to your videos. <laughs> Good job. I recently did a lower leg service, brilliant. And whilst I had the front end of the bike apart, I cleaned and serviced the headset too. This seems to be one of the areas where Trek have cut costs on the bike as it has simple cage bearings and no cartridge. The top bearing has some rust and will need to be replaced. My question is, can I upgrade the headset and install better cartridge bearings or does the frame design restrict me to using the cage type? Uh, and if so, where's the best place to find them? I'm struggling to uh, make sense of the sizing needed. Um, all right, so without getting too specific here, basically, Cage bearings are absolutely fine and for many years all bikes use them. The only rule with cage bearings is basically if you over tighten a bearing you could pit the bearing surfaces by basically compressing the bearings into it making it lumpy and if you rode them dirty for too long they wear out really fast. Uh, you can get surface rust but also the use of the bearings on the actual bearing surface can polish that off again. So if it's just cosmetic surface rust it's not the end of the world. Um, the important thing with them is to keep them clean and keep, keep them heavily greased basically with a real heavy duty uh, weatherproof grease. Of course if you're riding in sandy dusty conditions or wet muddy conditions you can need to check that and change that because any addition to grit into there is just going to wear it all out. It turns into like this horrible grinding paste. Now it's not as simple as just getting a cartridge bearing and dropping it into your headset unfortunately. Uh, your options really are to buy a new bearing race which is fine, they're nice and cheap and it will probably be a fairly standard item that any good bike shop will have in stock. But cartridge bearings rely on a headset that basically has a recess for the bearing to just drop in. Um, with your bearings, the bearing surface is the headset itself and your bearing sits in and rotates around it so you're not going to be able to put a cartridge bearing into your specific headset unfortunately. So um, there's your answer, new headset or simply just get some new bearings and basically an overhaul with some really good quality grease. Um, to be honest, I've been inclined to go that way. There's no real need to change it unless you've got a burning desire to buy a brand new headset. Um, perhaps if you do want to go for a new headset, definitely consider something that's got a really substantial warranty on it because it's one of those parts of the bike that you're really going to be reluctant to do anything with it until it breaks. Um, so you may as well save yourself from cash in the first place and buy something that's got a decent warranty and you just keep on trucking. Um, I've never actually owned a Chris King headset, but if I was going to buy a headset tomorrow, it probably would be a Chris King headset. Um, mainly because their warranties, mainly because the bearings themselves, the actual cartridge bearings can be rebuilt. Um, they're just notorious for their quality. It's pretty much a buy once type affair. But there's also some other amazing headsets out there, really good quality. British brand Hope have a pick and mix system so you can pick your upper and lower cups depending on your frame. You don't have to just buy the whole headset. Um, that's a really nice way of doing things and obviously they have every colour under the sun. They're beautifully made and they use simple bearings to just drop in and out. Uh, of course you can get different standards of the bearings themselves as well. So it does become a bit of a minefield. And another brand just to drop in it is Cane Creek. They make some excellent headsets and they also do their famous angle set headsets. Uh, if you fancy changing the steering angle or the head angle of your bike, they do some basically work on a gimbal basis. You can take up to 1.5 degrees off or on to your head tube angle there. Um, just a bit more trivia for you. Um, good luck. Okay, this is a bit of a good one for Ask. So this one's for Noah Moore. Can we get uh, an examination of the new Colorado-based Gorilla Gravity? Um, so they've got a modular carbon lineup of bikes. I'm curious about the geometry too, not just your thoughts on the concept. Uh, I did look at this the other day actually, because Claudio, one of our researchers here, he was taking a look at it and he really liked the idea of it. In particular, there was a bike, I think it was a 29er with about 120 mil travel and that's kind of the thing that I always talk about and they've got one with really good geometry. Um, all right, so I'm gonna actually do this now and have a quick look, right? So what I do know about them is they're, they're built in Colorado and they're, well, they seem like quite a cool sort of small niche brand. Um, yeah, right, so like you say, they're a modular system. This is cool, right? So there seems to be four models. There's a smash, so that's 29er, 145 mil travel. The trail pistol, the 29er 120 trail, yeah, that's the one I would probably have out of all of those. Uh, Mega trail, 27.5 with 155, 165 travel. 
Shred Dog, Shred Dog, uh, 27 and a half, 130 to 140. Right, so they've got four sizes by the looks of it. Okay, so they call them size one, two, three, and four, rather than small, medium, large, and extra large. Okay, right, so this is cool, right, so they've got the modular frame platform thing and they've got a geo adjust headset. So this is really cool. So on the Santa Cruz team bikes, uh, Greg Minar had basically a headstock system in there where you could actually move the headset fore and aft to change the reach on the bike. So they have a system just like this and they call it geo adjust. They say it alters the bike reach plus and minus 10 mil. So that's fantastic if you wanna have different options, basically change the ride characteristics of the bike you've already got. Um, I wish more companies would do that. I think that's a, like, a brilliant idea. But they also, they've got these seat stay kits. Right, okay, so you can change the travel and the wheel size of your frame in combination with the headset. All right, so I guess the idea is you buy one of their frames, whichever one you like, but you could, for example, I could have the 290120 and turn it into a 290145 if I wanted to go and hit bike parks. That is a really, really good concept. I can't see geometry listed, but if I just put in here, uh, I would have, I'm 6'3", and I would just say aggressive, because I know that's gonna be longer. Yeah, all right, so here it says, an extra large in the trail pistol, which is that 120 bike, it's got a reach of 523 mil. That is 523, that's seriously long. So that mega I've got, that's a long bike, that's 515 mil. Although there is something that does, I definitely want to ask a question about this. So they're carbon. This is interesting. So they call it revved up carbon or revved carbon. Um, carbon front end, aluminium back end. They say their carbon construction has got 300% more impact resistance than other designs. Um, I'd like to know a bit more about that and what they mean by that. If it's simply impact resistance to put up with rocks flying or crashing, then that's a fantastic claim. Um, something I've just noticed that is really cool is there's no press fit anywhere. Standard BSA bottom bracket shell, so that's threaded bottom brackets on all the frames. That's really smart. They've got frame storage system. Fantastic to have that as an option. I think they look really, really good. I'd definitely be keen to try one, I've got to say. Okay, back to the usual sort of question here. This one's from the British biker. Um, what do you think of a steel hardtail like the orange P729? Um, I quite like a steel hardtail. If they're done right, they can ride fantastically. Uh, the thing with steel over aluminium is steel is obviously heavier, but if you use thinner wall steel, you get a really, really beautiful, like uh, a springy sort of ride to it. It's a lovely dampened material to ride when you compare it to an alloy frame. Like this scout I've got behind me here, amazing frame. But man, like, if you make a mistake on it, it lets you know it's a really stiff frame. But mind you, that's exactly why Blake loves the stiff frame, because he wants to just slam it into stuff and know where he is. Whereas something like that orange you're talking about is gonna have that nice, slight resilience, let's call it that. Um, I'm a big fan of steel frames. Obviously, if you scratch them, you, they can get surface rust on them, which you're never gonna get with aluminium. Um, so they, you do have to take a little bit more care of them. And of course, some steel bikes are gonna naturally be heavier than the same equivalent in an alloy frame just because of the way the material is. Um, I, I really like them. Um, also, other materials worth looking into if you're interested in the ride qualities of steel. Titanium is like still, I would say, still like a dream material for certain bikes, in particular hardtails. So you effectively have a slightly springier and more resilient ride than steel, although it's very close. Some manufacturers have cleverly made steel frames with really thin seat stays to offer the same ride attributes that you can get with tie, but tie will never corrode. A beautiful, beautiful material, but you have to know what you want when you buy one because they're very expensive. Um, but the ride qualities are absolutely fantastic. Basically, imagine like a posh steel frame. Um, obviously, they're pretty dear though. Another double bubble. So this one is again from the British biker. Uh, what are the GMBN's guys' thoughts on high-end coil forks? Uh, coil forks feel absolutely amazing. And the difference, although the difference is slightly less now, that said, than it was a few years ago, but coil forks, simply put, if you're riding bike parks and super rough terrain, you really, you're gonna try hard, you're gonna, it's gonna find it hard to beat the feel of a coil fork. They're so consistently supple and nothing changes because it's not like an air spoon that can get hot or anything else. It's like, it's just a, basically a metal coil on the inside of the fork. The breakaway on them is, unbelievably active. The way they track the ground, you definitely know when you're riding a coil over an air fork. Um, although that said, air forks these days, with additions like volume spaces in them and like the bigger negative air chambers, they are incredibly active. Now perhaps if I was, well, Blake actually, coil would suit him because the way he rides and tends to wreck stuff. 
Um, if I was a racer, I might consider a coil spring on the rear and a coil fork on the front, but they're not actually that convenient for me because sometimes I ride with the camera bag that's quite heavy and that changes my dynamic weight and position on the bike and the way I ride. So I would have to continuously change the coil springs to get it just right. Now, something else with coil springs is the increments that they come in. You're never gonna get, unless you luck out, of course, you're never gonna get the absolute perfect sag. You'll get very close to it, and then you'll have to use preload. And preload basically just adds a preload to the spring. It doesn't change how firm the spring is. It just changes the force that initially gets it moving. So basically you can set it up if you're slightly heavier uh, and get around it. But it's not sufficient enough to work around things like heavy camera bags, or let's just say you're riding to work with tools and stuff in your bag like I also do quite often. Uh, with an air shock it's super easy and this infinite adjustment just to add in a few more pounds, super easy to get back again where you were. Um, same with an air fork and for that reason I think that is why they're the most popular on the market all round because they're, they suit anyone. Bike shops don't have to carry like insane amounts of spare springs for forks and shocks and of course they're going to be different sizes depending on how much travel you have, how heavy you are, what brand they are etc. Air really is king, although certainly coil performance, um, if it's just out and out performance, I think is probably better. There we go, we're out of time. So that's another weekly show in the bag. If you've got any questions or you want to add some comments, get involved down there below. And for a couple more useful videos, if you want to see our essentials playlist, click over here. I think that's always good. I'm sure we all know people that could benefit from that. So share that lot around and click down here if you want to see our Pro Bikes playlist. We're going to start kicking this year off some really good ones soon and they're going to fire straight into there. As always, don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up if you love what we're doing and like and share our stuff. Cheers, guys.